Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning also to members of the public viewing and also members of the press viewing. Uh, welcome to the very first remote meeting of Merseyside Police and Crime Panel, which may be the first remote meeting of uh, any Merseyside political body. I'd have to check that. We're moving into the 21st century now. So the purpose of today's meeting is to conduct a confirmation hearing in relation to the Commissioner of Police and Crimes proposed appointment for a deputy. Um, we are doing this meeting via YouTube due to the current government restrictions giving, given uh, the COVID-19 situation. Uh, and this is being broadcast live via YouTube. Now, to members of the public for ease of guidance, this will uh, focus on the current member of the panel speaking at any one time. Um, I will direct members of the panel to speak uh, each once, just to make sure that we don't get any uh, trips whilst we're doing the meeting. Um, and to demonstrate how this will work, I will go through first of all myself, then the officers, and then the members of the panel, um, so members of the public are aware of who is who. My name is Councillor Paul Lynch, I'm the Chairman of the panel, and I'm a Labour and Cooperative Councillor in Moss Bank Ward in St Helens. Uh, if we move to Mr. Moran. Hello, my name's David Moran. I'm Scrutiny and Partnership Manager at Nosey Council, and I'm supporting the panel today. Richard, can you go ahead? Hi, I'm Richard Harrison. I'm Scrutiny and Partnership Officer at uh, Nosey Borough Council, and I'm here to support the uh, panel today. Fantastic. Councillor Jones. Uh, Adrian Jones, I don't think you can see me, but I can see you. I'm a member of the uh, Whittle Borough Council. Councillor Aston. Good morning, I'm Councillor Jane Aston, um, and I'm the Nosey Council representative on the panel today. Councillor Sayers. Uh, good morning, I'm Councillor John Sayers of Sefton Metropolitan Borough Council uh, and I'm the Labour Councillor for Park Ward in the Gulf. Councillor Rowlands. Good morning, I'm Councillor Rowlands, uh, Conservative Councillor for Heswell Ward and panel member for the Whittleborough Council. Councillor Jennings. Good morning, I'm Councillor Sarah Jennings. I'm Green Party member for St Michael's Ward in Liverpool. Hi David, I'm just trying to get him in as soon as I possibly can. I don't know why he's not here. Councillor, um, Councillor Shaw. Hello, uh, I'm Simon Shaw. I'm Lib the Lib Dem representative on the panel and I'm one of the two representatives from Sefton Council. I represent Burtdale Ward in Southport. And last but not least, Mr Pickup. Hello, I'm yeah. Keith Pickup. I'm an independent member on the panel. Uh, I live in Liverpool. Thank you, Keith. Mr. Moran, um, have we received any apologies? Um, we've received apologies from Councillor Liz Parsons. Yeah. Thank you. And have we had any declarations of interest from members? No declarations of interest have been received, Chair. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, members, as always, should, in the, should during the course of the proceedings you realise that you do have a disclosable interest, uh, please alert me as soon as possible and we'll make sure that that is recorded. Obviously, as you know, um, we do have, um, if, if there is a financial uh, interest that you do have, uh, you do need to let us know as soon as possible. <coughs> Um, hmm. So I'll now hand over to Mr Moran uh, in relation to the um, legal and uh, constitutional position that we are in uh, and he'll run through that now. Thank you David. Um, just in terms of the item that is in front of um, the panel in this public part of the proceedings. 
um, you are under an obligation as the panel to fulfil your statutory responsibilities um, wherever the commissioner is seeking to appoint a, a, a senior position within our office, and that includes the position of Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, in these situations, the, the panel is obliged under the legislation to review the commissioner's proposed in appointment of the preferred candidate, um, then make a report to the commissioner on the proposed appointment. In that report, you're expected to include a recommendation um, that will indicate whether the panel um, believes that the candidate should be appointed or not. Um, and then you would be expected to publish that report in accordance with your agreed practice, placing it on the Nosley Council website at the earliest opportunity. Um, just to be clear, the candidate in front of you today, Mr. Philip Davis, um, you are being asked to determine um, whether Mr. Davis meets the minimum requirements required um, for the position of Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, in order to do that, um, in accordance with the guidance, you will be asked, you will now ask him a number of questions relating to his professional competence um, and his personal independence. Um, and over back to you, Chair. Well, thank you, David. Um, I would also like to make clear both to the public and to members that um, the hearing today is, has been given very strict guidelines by a piece of legislation called the Police Reform and Responsibility Act 2012. Um, that, what that says is that the panel's job is to make sure that the candidate nominated is qualified under the terms of that legislation. Um, if there are concerns from the public, and we understand entirely these, um, we are almost, we are very willing to accept comments, correspondence, and queries in relation to this. However, I must make clear the uh, direction of this hearing today is purely to assess Mr. Davis's uh, qualification and competence for the role that he's been appointed to by the deputy, by the police and crime commissioner. So I will move forward. Uh, before I move on to the questions round, um, I will uh, bring in Mr. Davis, who has joined us now, uh, to introduce himself um, and indicate that he's ready to move forward. Yeah, Mr. Davis, I believe I've just unmuted you. Would you like to, uh, can you, first of all, can you see, hear, and uh, otherwise you can enter the panel? Yes, I can. Fantastic. And um, would you be able to uh, introduce yourself and give a short background uh, on your appointment? Yeah, um, so I was um, leader of Wirral Council um, up until uh, May of last year when I, when I stood down. Um, I was leader. Uh, of the council for seven years. I was a councillor uh, in Wirral for 28 years, first being elected in 1991. Um, I was quite extensively involved in the creation of the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. Uh, I was the, the first chair of the Combined Authority. Um, I've worked extensively with um, other local authorities in Merseyside and other partners. Um, and um, yeah, uh, just to, I think the other thing to say is um, I, uh, you know, I was approached by by Jane Kennedy to see if I'd be interested in in helping out uh, as her deputy. Um, I agreed to do the the role for for a year because I think she was facing some some challenges, and obviously the latest kind of emergency um, on the in terms of the virus has, has exacerbated that. So I'm retired, but I'm able to, um, you know, get involved immediately and uh, do whatever I can to help the smooth running of of her office. Um, uh, finally, I think a lot, lot of um, experience of engaging with communities. Um, that was a, a, a kind of key key role uh, as a as a leader and also as as a councillor. 
um, and and feel that I could hit the ground running. So I think in a nutshell, Chair, that, that, that would be my background. Thank you, Mr Davis. I'll just meet you for one second. Um, so thank you very much for attending. Um, our first question comes from Council Aston. So again, the procedure will be, I'll allow the panel member to ask the question um, and then I'll mute them and unmute you again, uh, just so we have a clear understanding of what's occurring. So, Councillor Aston, would you be able to start with question one, please? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Morning, Phil. Um, as the Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner, what do you think would be the key responsibilities for that role? Apologies, there you go. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think from, from my point of view, um, the, the key responsibilities and key priorities would be to help the commissioner to um, achieve her uh, priorities in the police and crime plan, um, you know, around preventing crime, antisocial behaviour, providing visible, accessible neighbourhood policing, um, tackling serious and organised crime, um, the the uh, agenda around victim support, and also she's doing. I know doing a lot of work around enhancing road safety. So I think um, for for me, I I you know I always uh, I see the police and crime plan as the sort of um, kind of golden thread which which links uh, things together, and obviously assist with her one of her key responsibilities, which is uh, providing that bridge between the public and the police. Uh, and and holding the uh, chief constable to to account for delivering those priorities. Right, I have I have um, a follow up question. Uh, I believe from Councillor Sayers. If I can bring Councillor Sayers in. No, it's okay, Chair. I'll leave it till the very end. Uh, it's not relevant to where we're at. Thank you. No worries. Uh, panel members, if you can indicate using the hand raise function, uh, if anyone has any follow-ups to question one. Okay, if we move on to question two from Councillor Shaw. Hello. Hi, Councillor Shaw. Hi. Hi, Mr Davis. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, one of the key skills identified for the role of the Deputy Police and Crime uh, Commissioner is obviously to work with uh, members, elected members of all political parties in a constructive way. So I just wonder if you could give an example, perhaps, of where you've done this in the past. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah, um, a couple of examples, really, um, uh, and I do think it's important. Uh, I've always seen it as important to to uh, work constructively with with people from from all parties when I've been a councillor. But um, I think the most uh, sort of uh, extensive example I can give is uh, Wirral went through quite a Wirral Council went through quite a challenging period not so long ago in terms of its corporate governance, and we had a a kind of all party improvement board which uh, I was a member of and and worked to um, you know to make sure that we could address our corporate governance challenges um, uh, on a cross party basis um, so so that was quite an extensive piece of work lasting a couple of years and I think the other example latterly is we've been through some challenging uh, sort of times in Wirral um, with our uh, children's services department and we had a, I chaired a, a kind of all party uh, group to uh, to address those challenges and, and thankfully, uh, you know, we've now come out of intervention and um, are, I think, moving forward. So I keep saying we as if I'm still there, um, but but the council's now moving forward. And, and I think um, I've always taken the view that um, where you can uh, work together um you should do and you know 95 percent of the the issues there was there was all you know in certainly in Wirral there was a there was a consensus um particularly around things like um uh, jobs and employment investments and i you know always were very was very happy to to work uh with 
with um, colleagues from from all parties um and, and and i do believe that's essential and i think it's essential particularly around the you know the crime and community safety agenda um which really i don't think politics should play a big role in 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 the things that we're trying to achieve in merseyside on that agenda thank you mr davis um do colleagues have any follow-up questions or queries on question two if you could indicate using the uh the hand raise function okay no uh, we move on to question three which was um, originally meant to be asked by our colleague Councillor parsons however he's unable to attend today uh, so i'll be taking on the, this question what steps would you take to ensure that you have buy-in from uh, people working on a project, particularly uh, uncooperative agents? Because obviously you will be involved in the coordination of cross-region policies and indeed you know, larger region policies as well. And a difficulty is often that people will intend to uh, act in a, in a in a realistic manner for their own areas rather than a cooperative manner for it for a re for the regional area so how have you dealt with uncooperative uh, partners in the past and how would you do so moving forward in the future yep um can you hear me yep um i mean i think it's very much about understanding if if people are uh unhappy with particular on particular issues try and understand what their concerns are um to I, you know i think it's important to um to listen to be a good listener to, to try and sort of empathize with what their concerns are and to come up with kind of constructive solutions which meet their concerns but also enable the um, you know the, the the kind of agenda to be taken forward. So I'm I've always been one for uh, sitting down and you know talk, talking through issues in a cool, calm, and rational way. And and if there's a need to compromise, then that's not a bad thing. Um, uh, and and so I've all that's the, the approach I've always taken, um, both with elected members and communities and partners, because um, at the end of the day, often uh, with with some uh, you know uh, calm talking around the table, there's often a, a solution that everybody could live with. So I think it is about using those kind of interpersonal communication skills um, to to address those kind of issues. And I, I, I have encountered that. Uh, quite quite a lot with my my in my the various roles that I've, pl I've played. So that's basically would be my approach. Now, if I may, if I may Mr. Davis, as as a follow up, obviously crime and justice, community safety is um, is. With Oh, lost you of the procedure sorry have i have i just cut sorry. off there sorry councillor lynch I, I you got cut off and i, and I missed the missed the oh, question i'm going to blame bt broadband <laughs> <if I'm honest. laughs> um, i appreciate what you're saying about diplomacy between um individuals and interpersonal relationships and building those long-term uh, relationships i suppose one if it can be blunt this won't be a long-term appointment you are uh, being appointed uh, to to support jane for one year just about yeah. um yeah. and i suppose so you won't have a lot of time to build a lot of those relationships and also um as local representatives of local authorities we are quite rightly um very parochial when it comes to community safety um and the la last thing we want to see is the is an imbalance or the appearance of an imbalance over um police funding over police policy you know i represent st helens we have a long-standing complaint about a significant proportion of the borough is not covered by a police station and it's likely that we're going to lose more more resource um in the future potentially um 
So when you're dealing with, what I'm saying is, you're going to find situations in the next year that can't be dealt with entirely diplomatically or entirely by compromise. And how would you deal with that? Um, okay. Well, I mean, I think um, clearly, if there is a, um, uh, if there's an imperative, if there's a, a, a policy or an issue where um, the commissioner has got a clear, um, you know, a clear uh, imperative priority. I, I would obviously make it clear at the start that that's that's the kind of direction of travel um because at the end of the day decisions have to be made you know you can't go on talking forever so you know at some point you have to draw the line to say i've done everything i can but that's the direction of travel i i would hope um and this is why i i hope i could hit the ground running but i've i've already got or, a lot of you know relationships in place with, uh, for example, I know the the leaders of the various councils very well. I've worked with them for many years, um, I, I, and also the partners. So um, I'm not. I, I appreciate I've only got a year in the post, but I'm hopefully already um, relatively well well known and hopefully respected uh, to be able to have that kind of. Um, sort of gravitas, if you like, to carry policies through. But to go back to your original question, Councillor Lynch, you know, if there's an imperative to to get a particular policy over the line, then we've got to do that. And, and at some stage, the talking uh, and the conversations have to stop and we just need to make a decision. And I'm used to making decisions, um, you know, on a whole range of, of urgent issues uh, in, in the roles that I've played as both leader of the council and um, on the combined authority. Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry. Mr. Pickle, I'd like to bring you in uh, with a follow up, if that's all right. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Davis. Can you hear yes. me? <laughs> yeah. Mr. Davis, you've said you've uh, handled. It were difficult situations quite often. Can you give us an example, say, where you have perhaps had to adapt or modify your own views to deal with the situation? Yeah, um, I think, um, well, I suppose a couple of examples, one from my own council and then the, um, the city region. I mean, um, on a, on a number of the um, uh, difficult decisions we've had to make about, I mean, you'll know that the, the big challenge for, for anybody in public service now is, is how to cope with cuts in funding, but still provide good public services. And, you know, I've been doing this for so many years that I know that um, when you're having to make difficult decisions around cuts, particularly to the budget, you often have to come to a, modify your views and 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 i've um you know i've faced a number of uh, of, of issues so you know for for example um on the um you know the reduction of services where i've had to modify my view about what we can actually cope with um and we've we've come to we've come to we've, we've reduced the budget but maybe not as severely as we had to and i can think about that in terms of you know issues on, on my on my own council uh, where I've ha have had to modify my position. I suppose the 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 the, the, the other example, which um, is is probably uh, um, more uh, relevant to a, a kind of city region approach, is you know the whole uh, journey we went uh, on in terms of devolution and the combined authority. I was chair at the time, and you know each of the six leaders had. Um, you know, a whole series of, of issues that they uh, were concerned about. And as chair of the combined authority, my role was to try and chart, chart a consensus um, through what was a very difficult agenda around the, the creation of a new model of governance with a direct, directly elected mayor. Um, so, so again, um, we had to make, make lots of kind of compromise to come to a decision where we could sign the devolution deal in 2015. So those are the kinds of sort of issues that um, you know I would I would 
sort of uh, uh, put forward in response to that. Mr. Pickup, do you have a follow-up to your follow-up? No, no, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. No worries. Um, you now have uh, another question from me. Um, so this is kind of a follow-up to where I was uh, going before. How would you ensure that the views of diverse and hard-to-reach communities across Merseyside um, are taken into account? Because obviously there's the police are the police are the people and the people are the police but there's often a disconnect um between one people who uh, can relate to the police but also in terms of police priorities relating to communities right across merseyside you know i mentioned earlier that the tech can be being at what can be considered the tail end of merseyside in st helens ourselves we can feel um lack of investment in relation to this. So I was, I was wondering what your views are on how to bring people into the fold and to bring people's um, positions uh, into the policy making process. Okay, I mean, I think that's very much about um, making the effort to, uh, you know, uh, go and talk to communities and individuals who, who feel left behind. Um, you know, that's something that I've I've had a lot of experience of. I I represented a ward in Wirral, Birkenhead and Tranmere, where I had a lot of communities who were, you know, very disadvantaged, um, felt outside the mainstream. Um, I made it my business to go out and talk to residents groups, tenants associations. I have a I had a big Muslim community within my ward. Um, so talk to, um, you know, communities like that who are often um, left out of the agenda. So I think it's just, you know, it's again making making uh, yourself of uh, being proactive and doing those kind of, of meetings and, and building on existing networks um, of, of groups and associations. But it's just, I think, I think it is about going the extra mile to make sure that those um, you know those communities and geographical areas that are left behind uh, feel included by by doing that personally and going out and just making yourself available. And I've, as I say, I've I've had lots of experience of doing that. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, does anyone have a follow? I do have a uh, councillor Rollins. If I can uh, bring you in there. Yes. Thanks. Thanks so much. Can you hear me, Phil? Yeah, hi Les, how are you? I'm fine. Um, having received a, you know, a numerous amount of uh, letters and emails with with regards to this appointment, the way the appointment has been dealt with and uh, the track record that you uh, have said that you've had on Whittleborough Council, which I personally don't recognise, um, uh, you know, how... how do you feel about taking up a job where a lot of the people of Wirral uh, don't wish you to be taking that job? Um, well, I think uh, I mean I've seen some of the some of the uh, the comments. I think I think from my point of view, what my 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 sort of position is, and and this is my my sort of pitch, if you like, to the panel is, I, I do believe um, that I have considerable experience um, of, uh, of the uh, challenges within Merseyside and particularly uh, around the um, crime community safety agenda. Um, you know, I just, I think it's unfortunate if politics gets in the way uh, of doing what I think is important in terms of delivering the priorities that the Commission has set out in her police and crime plan. Um, I've also led, I have to say, I've had lots of very positive comments from people uh, I used to work with, both um, elected members, officers and people from other partnerships. So it's not just all been one way. And I think at the end of the day, it's it's just about saying, I, I think I've got the skills and the experience to be able to do this role. It's a short term, one year role to help the commissioner um, with uh, the, the very difficult job that she's got. And and really, I suppose that's my that's my um, sort of pitch, if you like, to, to why I think I could do the job. But you know, at the end of the day, 
you're never going to please everybody um and, and and i just accept that but i'm trying to i'm trying to sort of rise above the kind of comments i've seen to, to say you know look look just look at um the, the experience i've had in making the decision so i suppose that would be my my answer to that question uh council rose we'll bring you back in and then uh, we'll move to mr pick up if that's okay yeah sure uh, yeah go ahead yeah, Phil. Uh, the 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 biggest problem I I see is that you are giving a picture of your track record on the council, which obviously the people of Wirral have seen and disagree with the way you've handled a lot of situations. I'm not going to list those situations now. I'm sure you know you know about them. Um, obviously they do not have confidence in you. Um, with that track record that you've held. Um, and obviously this this job the way it has been done uh, which i feel is, is totally undemocratic because the the panel has had the rights to appoint a deputy commissioner if need be um there's been three candidates that's been overlooked approved candidates been overlooked and gone to yourself so why do you do you um deserve having this job given the fact that the vast majority of the people of Wirral feel as though that you're being feisted upon them. Okay, thanks for that, Les. Um, well, I don't recognise that picture you've painted, and, and, and I don't think it's appropriate for me to, to go into a, a, a long defence of my record on Wirral Council. I'm very proud of what I achieved. Um, I'm not going to say I never made any mistakes, but I don't recognise the picture that you've painted, Les. Um, and, and what I would say is, in the response to the other part of your question, um, clearly the Commission has taken the view that given the extraordinary times that we are living in with the, um, you know, the coronavirus crisis, there just simply isn't the, the time and the opportunity to do a, you know, a standard kind of recruitment process. Uh, and, and we are in an emergency situation and she does need help. Um, at the moment, she has not got any deputy if she, if she was, for, for whatever reason, incapacitated. So I think there are extenuating circumstances. Um, I, I wasn't looking to come out of retirement, I have to say, but I was asked by Jane as someone who, who has got um, that experience if I could fill in just for a year. And I think all those, those um, uh, factors take into account. I feel I could do the role. On, on that basis. Now, Councillor Owens, I am going to bring you back in. However, I will stress that um, Mr. Davis isn't here today to answer on the process. Uh, we will be focusing on the confirmation of the candidate or la lack of confirmation, however, we decide later. Uh, and I am wary of straying too far from the agenda. Um, we've, we've set out in our briefings, as I'm sure you've received, the legal and statutory position on appointment. Um, and I'm not looking to move on into a into a long ranging discussion on that if, if that's okay with you. Um, now I will ask if you have a further follow up before I move on to Mr. Pickle. Well, there's no follow up because it's pointless. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's a foregone conclusion. Um, it, it, it's totally undemocratic as far as I'm concerned. What's the point of the panel if the panel is not being able to participate properly? And select a candidate. That is three approved candidates that that would that have been overlooked uh, in this process. I don't see such an emergency where this panel cannot handle it. Mm. I do take I do take your point. Um, however, I trust you accept that um, we won't be moving further into discussions around the process. That's obviously the the relevant statute. Um, has given the commission of that authority. It's given us our role, which is to assess this. Um, and what I will do now is move on to uh, Mr. Pickup, um, who's been waiting quite patiently with his follow-up query. Mr. Pickup. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Davis, you talked about, in your original answer to this question, you talked about uh, talking to such groups as the Muslim community, etc. But can you give any practical, what I would call practical, hard example of where you might have worked with one of the other 
vulnerable uh, groups, say, in Merseyside, Chinese, Black, LGBT, uh, travellers, the names but, but some, but hard examples of where you've worked with people rather than just talked. Yeah, yes, I can. I um, for for many years I was the um, I was involved and I was on the board of the Wirral Multicultural uh, Organisation based in in Birkenhead, and I, I worked extensively with the um, the communities involved in that organisation: the Asian community, the Chinese commu community, uh, the Vietnamese community, around. Um, uh, helping those communities to access services and it was actively involved in um, first of all um, establishing the, the multi -organize, multicultural organization and, the, and, and acquiring a, a dedicated building that they could use for uh, meetings and festivals. Um, I was involved in um, my work around uh, setting up the Wirral Youth Zone for young people and getting um, people from those uh, minority and ethnic communities, that young people uh, involved and integrated with the um, uh, the, uh, the services that the youth zone provide and the sports and recreation facilities. So I I feel I've I've had a lot of kind of practical uh, hands-on work in in helping those minority communities um, access services and improve improve the. Um, quality of life that families in those communities experience on a, on a daily basis. Mr Pickup, do you have any further comments or queries on that? No, not at this stage, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move on then to uh, Councillor Aston uh, and question five. Councillor Aston. Thank you, Chair. Um, Phil. As the deputy PP, PCC, how would you ensure the transparency of the commissioner's decision-making process? Thank you, Jane. Mr. Davis. Uh, okay, I mean, I think it's 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 about um, making sure that uh, there is there is an opportunity for uh, people to sort of scrutinise decisions. Uh, I think I think the. If, with greatest respect, Chair, I think the police and crime panel have got an important role to play in, uh, you know, in that respect, in in uh, acting as a sort of um, critical friend, if you like, of the commissioner, and and also making sure that um, just to go back to the discussion we had earlier on, uh, community organisations, um, uh, individual areas of the Merseyside. Um, are are involved in in decisions before they're made. So um, I think you know for for me, open, openness in transparent and transparency, uh, I think is is essential. I I regard I always felt that you know that was part of the kind of leadership style that I tried to promote, uh, and just being as as open and honest as people. And sometimes you have to tell people uncomfortable truths. Um, particularly where we're talking about kind of lack of resources or, or, or difficult uh, choices that need, need to be made. But I think there are formal processes uh, and there are informal processes. But at the end of the day, um, just, you know, I think communicate, good communi lines of communication are, are essential so that people understand. They may not agree. I, I've always felt that you know, people may not agree with decisions you make, but as, as long as you explain to them why you're making those decisions and they've got an opportunity to comment and influence those decisions that, before they're being made, then I think that, that, that you know, you, could, you can work, move forward on that basis. Thanks, Jake. Jake. Would you like yeah, to... Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Jake. No worries. Uh, Mr. Davis, I, I mean... I think this is a, a key question today. Um, whilst I don't wholly agree with Council Rowland's position, obviously there is significant concern um, in the in the public and in the wider political sphere as well um, around the transparency of this process itself. Um, and obviously the big danger with any kind of community safety or national security decision that is made in emergency is that soon everything becomes an emergency so how would you deal with um 
future situations like the one that's brought out brought about your own appointment um sorry could you just could you could you just explain a bit more embellish that a bit more uh, yeah, yeah. future situations so obviously we're talking about a a climate of openness yeah. and transparency around policy mm -hmm. um, and whilst we are of course in unprecedented times to use the government's phrase mm -hmm. um it is it's all it should always be a matter of concern when um we, when basically we're just avoiding breaching a statutory duty rather than encouraging a process of openness. What lessons would you learn from the uh, Ferrari around uh, the appointments process here in terms of uh, public and political engagement in the policy process, um, Deputy Commissioner? Well, again, I think it's about trying to be open with people to explain you know when you're in um a very unusual situation as we are now why you're having to do things obviously in an ideal world um we we would you know we th this appointment would be done uh, very differently i absolutely get that um but we the reality is that we are in a, a you know an emergency situation where we can't go through the normal procedures that we would in 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 um, you know um, usual circumstances. So I think it's just about being again open and honest with the public and explaining why we're having to do it the way we are. And 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 the, the just you know again without getting into the process um, uh, issue, chair. Uh, just being being very upfront with people as to why we're having to do it like this, and and the, the fact that this is an emergency, and I think it's just about it being really clear and explaining the the rationale for doing it the way we are. Okay, thank you. Do I have uh, any follow ups? I'm aware, Councillor Rowland, your uh, hand raise function is on, but I'm not certain if that was from a previous matter. I'll just bring you in briefly. Was that uh, from your follow up before? And no, it was left on. Sorry. No, no worries. That's fine. Uh, and I do have uh, no further follow-ups. Um, so if I move on to question six, uh, which is again from myself, um, this is around personal independence. Uh, obviously, you referred to the panel itself as a critical friend earlier. But the point of a deputy commissioner, which historically, at least in Merseyside, has always been a political appointment uh, rather than um, rather than a staff appointment as such, is that it's someone who could give counterweight to the commissioner's decisions and to the police. Obviously, it can be uh, a relatively difficult job to challenge the authority of the police on behalf of the public. How would you uh, maintain personal independence whilst maintaining um, a good working relationship? Yeah, well, I've I've had lots of uh, experience of doing this. I mean, um, you know, the um, the relationship between the leader of the council and the chief executive is, I think, um, akin to the um, PCC and the chief constable. I think it's about again, it's about. Um, just being open and honest with people and, and saying that although, you know, uh, I, um, you know, I'm part of the organisation, uh, there are occasions when I will have to take a, a you know, a contrary view to the conventional wisdom or the view that you're taking. Um, and and the, the main thing is we, we talk through those differences and try and come to a, uh, a consensus. But I think the important thing is that... Um, as deputy, I shouldn't, you know, and I won't be uh, afraid if I disagree with either the commissioner or the chief constable to, to say that. And I think you can do that in a perfectly um, acceptable way, and but and, and as, but still maintain a professional relationship as long as you know. The bottom line is you treat you treat people with respect uh, as you would like to be treated yourself. Um, and I think if you can. Uh, if you can have a relationship along those lines, I think it's perfectly possible to uh, hold people to account uh, and disagree with them, but still have a good working relationship with them.
Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry. There we go. I do have a follow up from uh, Councillor Sayers. Uh, apologies, John, I didn't uh, see your hand raised. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. It's a follow up question to the previous response uh, the candidate gave. Um, Mr. Davis, um, you were talk we were talking about the process, um, and I, I really wasn't going to quiz you on that originally, um, although I do have grave concerns about this process. What I'd like to, to just take up with you, we've mentioned that we're going through the process or you feel the process is necessary because of the crisis. And I've got two questions on that. One is, um, surely we haven't had a deputy now for, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't had a deputy now for 12 months. Now we enter the time of crisis and the PCC wants a deputy. But my feeling is the workload of the PCC must be much reduced at this time in respect of an awful lot of the front facing work that PCC and our officers do has now disappeared. Um, so there are no common parades, there are no public meetings, there are no consultations with, with members of the public, except in the process that we're doing now. Also, are you aware that the statute provides this panel with the power to appoint a PCC if uh, the current PCC, God forbid, was, was incapacitated in any way? Um, so the statute provides for that. It's not necessarily uh, that we have a deputy um, for, for that role. Thank you, John. <clears throat> okay, I mean, in terms of the first part of the question, um, it, it's difficult for me to say um, just what the, the workload um, is in these extraordinary circumstances. All, all, I can, all I can say, and I think that's a question really more for the commissioner rather than me, is my impression is that there is still a huge amount of work going on. I mean, think people are having to do things remotely, um, but but um, you know, given the the lockdown, uh, I don't think that means that the, that the workload's reduced. Um, that's the impression I've got from speaking to the commissioner. Um, and in terms of the second part of the question, um, yeah, I, I get the fact that the panel would has the power to appoint a new PCC, but inevitably there would be a there would be a gap and a delay um, in doing that because even with the best will in the world, you, you know, you'd have to find a candidate, you'd have to go through the, a similar process. So I, I, I guess my response to that is, if you've got a deputy um, who, who is already in place, <clears throat> that just makes the, uh, the ability to cope with a situation where the um, commissioner is, is incapacitated much easier than having to, in the middle of a crisis, hold some kind of, you know, uh, uh, re emergency recruitment process. And I'm going to bring Councillor Sayers back in there, but I do have to pick up on that point. Um, I believe what Councillor Sayers is referring to is that the statute actually provides for us to appoint um, the PCP, uh, PCC Chief Executive, which is this oh, right. and Clive Howarth, um, to, to become the acting PCC. Now, Home Office guidelines additionally also state, one, that there should be a deputy, but also that two, anyone appointed would serve um, until the next elections, which at the moment are May 2021. But I, I, do, I do just want to challenge that point that um, before I bring uh, Councillor Sayers back in, that it's not an appointment or recruitment process as such. Uh, we would be in an emergency meeting and uh, appoint either the chief exec or I do believe there is some scope for another member of the commission of staff uh, but it would you know third in line is the chief exec so I can bring councillor Sayers back in now John? Uh, uh, yeah you stole the point from me chair I was going to say about that. it does concern me that the candidate doesn't seem to know that uh, the emergency provisions allow us to appoint uh, the chief executive or the member of the staff to cover in, in times of extremis um, Thank you, Chair. No further questions. Thanks, John. Uh, and I, I will, to, to avoid any accusation of uh, political favouritism, I will make the same point that I made to Council Rowlands earlier, uh, which is that obviously I don't want to stray into uh, the process too much, but I do appreciate the, the points that you have made. Um, do I have, I don't believe I have any further indications to follow up on, uh, on question six. Uh, next, we move on to question seven, uh, which is from Mr. Pickup. Uh, 
There you are, Keith, you're unmuted. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Davis, given the independence of the PCC's role and her responsibility to the electorate, what examples can you give us of how you have had to be accountable for the delivery of a particular policy to the general public? Mr. Davis? Um. Well, in almost everything I've done as leader, um, you have to be accountable to the public. Um, so, you know, everything from um, setting a budget uh, to, um, you know, delivering uh, uh, frontline services. Ultimately, as leader, I, I was accountable. Um, and and so that that almost goes hand in hand with um, with the roles that I've played. And at the end of the day, um, you know, you, you have to make yourself, um, uh, you know, answerable to the public, at, you know, on, a, on an ongoing basis, um, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, I, um, you know, I had, um, you know, uh, 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 lots of uh, uh, experience of, of liaising with uh, residents um, and answering, going to public meetings, uh, my advice surgeries. Um, you're constantly accountable because that goes with the nature of the, of, of, of the role. Um, so I, I think on almost every everything I've done, um, uh, certainly when I was leader, um, I've 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 had ongoing uh, accountability. And the and the job of a of a council leader is is twenty four seven. And you know you you just have to accept that that. <clears throat> um, being able to respond to public concerns or questions or, or, or ideas is is uh, an absolutely uh, you know vital role that, that you play. So I you know I've had I've had lots of experience. I could give you know if you want wanted to give me specific examples of policies or issues where I've uh, I, I've had to uh, uh, you know become be accountable and the. The work I've done, I can I can give that, but um, you know I, I would just make the general point that it, it's something that I'm very uh, used to and very familiar in kind of dealing with. And I think I will follow up on that before I bring anyone else in. I I believe the question was more about specific policy uh, developments, you know, that you've led and been accountable for. Um, so would you be able to provide a specific example from a, you know? your recent time as, as council leader? Yeah, so um, uh, the the establishment of a of a youth zone in the centre of Birkenhead for young people, uh, I was involved in, um, you know, uh, getting that off the ground, going out and speaking to um, young people, um, uh, speaking to uh, residence groups who live near nearby where the centre is, in um, in reassuring them, in in explaining the advantages and the benefits of of having a a, a centre for young people, you know that, that is open seven days a week, three hundred sixty five days a year. Uh, um, just making myself available to to explain to them why you know that kind of um, uh, facility is such a such a fantastic idea and the benefits it can have. So I certainly that's an example of a. Probably the proudest thing I've been involved in as a as a councillor because it was in my ward, but also as a council leader, and um, it, it it had huge and heavy public involvement from from day one, and 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 that was over a period of about three or four years. So so that's probably the most relevant example I can think of. I'm going to bring in first of all uh, Mr. Pickup and then Councillor Jennings. Keith, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Davis, statute and uh, rules, governance, etc., uh, cover what we can say and how we say it. Uh, it also affects the uh, way in which we conduct ourselves um, when we're dealing with uh, meetings and with the public. How has that constrained your delivery of a particular policy? To the public. Oh. I mean, I think um, clear, clearly, uh, 
So could you just explain what, what you mean by statute? Yes. Yeah. Basically, as a panel, for example, we have a set of rules governing what we can do and what we can't do and the limitations of that. Mm. Quite often, those are not ones which are known to the public or understood by the public. But in putting across a policy to people, quite often we have to do that without being able to fully explain what those rules and statutes are which govern the way we behave, but therefore what we transmit to other people. And sometimes those can, I suspect, as in your case, be an encumbrance as to how you put across the decisions that are made and the policy achieved. Yeah, I, I have had the experience of that. So, I mean, I can think of lots of, of examples, particularly in the in the area of um, kind of uh, uh, economic development, regeneration, where, you know, we've had commercially sensitive information, which legally we can't share with the public. Um, I can think of examples of, um, uh, issues where I've been involved in, which is, in, you know, which is involved kind of uh, personal information uh, about um, members of staff or etc, which I can't say anything about. So I'm, I'm used to working within a framework where, um, you know, there are um, strict uh, rules and regulations about what you can share with the public. But 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 again, um, I I believe that within those uh, within those kind of rules and regulations laid by down by statute, you just have to, uh, have to try and be as open as possible with people. And sometimes you have to explain why you simply can't share certain information with them. Mr. Pickup, do you have a further comment? No, I'll leave it there, there Chair. Thank you. No worries. Um, Councillor Jennings. Thank you, Chair. Um, hello, Mr. Davis. Nice to meet you. Hello. Um, I would like to refer back to something you said earlier on about the period in Wirral Council where you um, went through a change in governance and discussing that. So as you were leader of the council and prior to that deputy leader, what was your role in, in bringing that about? Um, and as having been in a position of authority there, what do you feel led to those accusations of lack of, uh, lack of accountable governance being made? Okay, um, well, we, we faced a situation in 2012 where we had a, a, a series of pretty um, uh, critical negative reports about different services and the way uh, that um, corporate governance operated. So, for example, um, you know, decisions would be made at council meetings and committee meetings that weren't properly followed up. Um, when people, when people um, made mistakes, they weren't held to account, uh, we didn't have proper record keeping of decisions, there was a whole sort of sort of list of, of issues around corporate governance which we, we frankly uh, were pretty poor at and you know when I, I, got, I got elected in 2012 as leader um, kind of just in the middle of all that and so I saw my my first few years as leader, my my priority really was to work with the uh, the improvement board that we had set up with the local government association and with colleagues in the council from all parties and and, and officers uh, to try and you know begin to address that 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 those those issues around poor corporate governance and um, you know it was a long hard slog and, and I you know I, I spent lots of uh, lots of time um, making sure that we learned from good practice in other local authorities in other organizations and brought that back to Wirral uh, and you know I, I do feel that we um, we uh, did move the authority forward and in 2015 we were voted the most improved council of the year so I, I think um, I had I had, um, you know, huge involvement in that whole agenda about how you um, move from a situation where you had lots of issues around poor, poor corporate governance to being an authority that was seen as outward looking and, and open and transparent. And I'm very proud of that period of my leadership. Councillor Jennings, would you like to come back on that? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just that I was wondering that, um, 
how long it took before you sort of noticed the red flags and how quickly were they acted on um, before the public reports came out? Um, because in your position of sort of political oversight, it just seems like uh, the, there was a, a deficit of, of corporate governance before you put those things in action. And did you flag up problems earlier? I think we saw we saw signs that things were you know were were going wrong, um, but it really I think it it it, it, it took um, it took some pretty hard hitting kind of external reports to say this is the extent of the challenge that you've got ahead, and I I took the view is uh, my view is very clear you know we shouldn't be in denial don't try to defend the indefensible um, take the advice take the um, uh, the sort of uh, lessons that would be w that we need to to learn from external experts like the LGA, and and move on from there. Don't don't try to cover things up or sweep things under the carpet. So, you know, <clears throat> at the time I was very open. Is yes, we've got all of these challenges and failings. The the priority now is to move forward and address them. Um, so that that was my philosophy and my approach. Uh, you know, when when uh, when we had that um, that challenge. Thank you. Councillor Jennings. No, thank you, Chair. That's it. That's the answer. Yeah. Right. Um, do I have any further comments, queries, or questions on that? Right. If I can now move to our eighth and final question, which is Councillor Jennings. It, sir, if you'd like to move forward. Yeah. Thank you. Um, again, this kind of relates a little bit to the last question as well, actually. Um, can you please explain how you've taken personal responsibility for successes and failures? And again, if we could refer back to something you mentioned earlier about the children's services, which um, were branded inadequate. And the Ofsted report actually stated that councils criticised for delays in making changes and improvements to the system. Um, and the delays were because of competing council um, uh, priorities. So I was wondering what were the priorities, how was children's services prioritised at that time, um, but within that envelope of your taking, um, accepting responsibility and um, for, for the success of the, the eventual outcome, but also for the original failings. Thank you. Yeah, I can, I, sorry. Um, yeah, that was a that was a very challenging kind of period for us uh, when the um, children's services went into intervention. Um, you know, I, I I took the view again at the time that um, uh, you know we needed to be open and honest, admit admit our our shortcomings, and 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 work with the um, the government, the Department of Education uh, about how we come out of intervention. Um, I think. You know, running running a, a a large local authority is is a really challenging job because you know um, you have to keep lots of plates spinning at the same time. You rely on your officers and your cabinet members to um, make sure that things are kept on track. Um, sadly, you know, in that in that case, um, that that didn't happen. Um, ultimately. Um, pe people, um, you know, did have to take take responsibility, and we had a, you know, our DCS resigned and our cabinet member resigned, and it was a really really difficult time because it, you know we were still coming out of the uh, corporate governance challenges, we had budget challenges, and you know it was it was it was very fraught, but uh, we had new leadership, both at officer and member level. Um, uh, and, um, you know, we rapidly kind of move forward with our, again, you know, um, working with our external advisors and our experts and looking at uh, working with other local authorities that had excellent uh, children's services and, and just putting things in place um, to give us the ability to, to, to move forward. And, you know, with, with our new director um, of children's services, uh, you know, we, we've come out of that now, and and I think again we had an improvement board, a children's services improvement board, which which I sat on, and and I, you know we came we came out of the, of intervention um, a few months ago, which was fantastic. Uh, so I, again, it was 
you know, it's, there's a, the, it's always difficult to 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 keep all of the plates spinning. And and I think, and again, and when things go wrong, you just have to hold your hands up and say, um, uh, you know, we we've got it wrong. How do we? I think the more important question is, what do we need to do to fix it? Uh, and being and and not again, not trying to be defensive or cover things up, but put things in place to move that service forward, which which we did. And I think there are lots of lessons that, you know, we have learned about how that service, um, you know, uh, got into the position it, it, it did. But I'm confident now that, you know, we, we, we've we come out of intervention and I think children's services in Wirral is well on the, the way to becoming a good and outstanding, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, children's department now, which I'm really delighted to see. Thank you, Mr. Davis. I have uh, Councillor Rowlands first, and then I'll move on to Mr. Pickup. Councillor Rowlands. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Lynch. Um, Phil, obviously picking up on on that uh, that you've just been talking about, um, you, you started off by saying that you know you're the most improved council, and then go on to point out, as as the other councillor has pointed out, the the um, the, the the failures. Um, obviously, you going on the same theme. Obviously, you've you've received um, and read the report on the new ferry explosion. Um, I want you to know your comments on how you handled that because it was on your watch, and and maybe a uh, given an apology. Have you given an apology to the people of New Ferry? Thank you, Councillor Rose. Thank you, Les. Uh, no, I haven't because I don't believe I do need to apologise. Um, I felt that we handled that disaster really effectively, uh, both at an officer level and a member level. I can remember vividly being in New Ferry the day after the explosion and being part of the team that galvanised all the resources of the council, our partners in the police, the fire authority, um, you know, the NHS. Um, we immediately put um, £300,000 of our scarce reserves to help the businesses and the residents were displaced you know we followed that up over the the, the last few years with ex additional funding um and um you know i have had several um you know uh, meetings with businesses and residents from new ferry who were really really glad of the role that the council played i think the one thing that i do think i'm very sad about is the is the complete lack of any um central government help for new ferry uh, it's all come from the council unfortunately um but i'm i don't believe i've got anything to apologize for i'm very proud of the role that i played and my administration played in in that disaster um so that's my that's my response to that question council Rowland, and then i'll I'm move on like... to the No, Mr. Councillor Rollins, have you got a uh, follow-up yeah, to that? Yes, I, I would actually. Um, obviously, uh, Councillor uh, Phil Davis, you you, uh, you, um, you you obviously don't take um, failures uh, rightly. Um, you, you have not uh, um, acknowledged them at all. You didn't write a plan to the to the government to get what money was available there. And the scarce resources of three 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 hundred thousand pounds was was pitiful uh, response. As far as I'm concerned, you, you know, you you were in charge of that, and you are demonstrating to me now that you don't take responsibility for your failures. So, I, I, how are you going to take responsibility in the the role of deputy commissioner, Mr. Davis? Um, well, I do believe that I take responsibility for things that go wrong. I've already explained at length the, um, the issues we had around our corporate governance in 2012, our children's services department. So, I, you know, I think I said on a couple of occasions, we held our hands up and said we got things wrong. Um, I do think it's, Les, it's a very bad example, New Ferry, because, you know, the council under severe financial constraint put in... 300,000 from our reserves. We put in 200,000 in the last year while, while I was leader of the council and 1.3 million of capital funding to acquire site, sites in New Ferry, which um, uh, businesses and investors could use to 
um, regenerate the town. Uh, I do think, you know, again, Chair, it's not appropriate, I think, to enter into a political debate about this. I do think my, uh, my issue about New Ferry uh, is that the government said repeatedly that the uh, disaster was not serious enough to qualify for the Bellwin scheme for disasters. That was the, I remember the letter I received from, from Jake Berry, the minister at the time, saying that. So it didn't, the government said it didn't qualify for disaster relief. And therefore we were, we were left as uh, on our own to provide help for that, for that community. And I do think the government have got a lot of questions to answer as to why they didn't put anything into Rock, Rock Ferry, uh, New Ferry um, when they did in, in other disasters like Grenfell and Salisbury. Thank you, Mr. Davis. I am going to uh, bring in Councillor Rowlands for a uh, sum up, if that's okay, before I move on to Mr. Pickup, who's waited quite patiently. Um, Councillor Rowlands. Much. Just want to sum up, Chair. Um, obviously, um, Mr. Davis has not read the, read the report properly. Um, it was an independent report. It, it has has doubted his, his uh, handling of it. The money was there if he'd, he'd applied for it properly. Yeah. They, they, they didn't do that. They wanted to play politics with it rather than, than actually help the people of New Ferry. And I do think that the people of New Ferry deserves an apology from him. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Owens. Mr Pickup. Yeah, Mr Pickup. Apologies, I hadn't unmuted yet. Mr Davis, um, following on in a sense from what's been asked before, you refer to the necessary advice from officers and staff and other councillors, but could you give an example of what you regard as a personal failing, the lessons you learned and any changes in your practice as a direct result? Yeah, I can, I can think of a, uh, an example. One of the one of the cuts we wanted to make on the council um, to again balance our budget was remute. We had um, we had a, a system where if you were a long serving um, council officer and you retired, you could get free admission to our ledger centres um, to use those facilities. And in one of the cuts that we were uh, having to make, sadly. Uh, we decided to withdraw that um, that concession, and uh, quite rightly, um, I uh, received lots of complaints and objections from uh, long-serving ex-officers and members of staff who uh, had previously received free access to our leisure centres. Um, I reflected. I reflected on that um, over a month or so, and decided it was the wrong thing to do. And I apologise to those people that we withdrew, we, we, uh, uh, we, uh, withdrew that um, facility for and instructed the chief exec to restore those passes. So that's a very specific example of where, again, I've held my hands up and said, you know, we got that wrong. We needed to think again. Mr. Pickup, do you have a follow up? Uh, no, I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Uh, do I have any further comments, queries, or questions uh, to Mr. Davis? You can please indicate by uh, the hands up function. Right. That concludes the uh, question part, at least from the panel. Mr. Davis, do you have any questions, comments, or queries to us? Um, no, I don't think I do. No, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, pass over to Mr. David Moore, who, uh, as panel members know, is our senior officer, uh, just to go through the uh, legality of the next stage of the process. Uh, so I'll just mute Mr. Davis. And uh, Mr. Moran, you're available now. There you are. David, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can everyone there hear me? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. In terms of previous practice in relation to confirmation hearings in accordance with guidance um, and in accordance with the agenda that's been published, um, having completed the question and answer session with the candidate 
Um, the panel will now move on shortly to deliberate in private on its response to the proposed appointment. Um, that involves excluding the press and public for those deliberations. Um, in terms of when the, the panel has reached its conclusions, as highlighted earlier, um, a response will be sent to the commissioner setting out the panel's recommendation. That will be in the form of a letter, and a copy of that letter will also be sent to Mr. Davis, the preferred candidate. Um, in this respect, just to be clear, Mr. Davis is not going to be asked to wait for the outcome of the panel's deliberation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Davis, thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, can I last of all ask if there are any further comments, queries or questions from members of the panel, if you can indicate by the hands up function. No, uh, Mr. Davis, you're now free to leave uh, the remote hearing. I hope you have a, a good Easter. Um, to you. Thank you. No worries. Thank you very much. All the best, everybody. Thank you. To members of the panel, I have no further items of an urgent nature. So if people can hang fire whilst I mute you all, because we need to uh, briefly vote. Um, as I have no items of an urgent nature, I intend to move after a 15 minute break um, to part two of the agenda. Um, I therefore move uh, the uh, I therefore move a resolution to exclude the press and the public. Uh, is that seconded? Second yeah. chair. And is that agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much, much to the press and the public. Uh, the panel will reconvene in private in 15 minutes to consider our recommendation. Uh, so that will be five past 12. Uh, and thank you everyone for uh, engaging with this process. Uh, and this meeting is now closed. Thank you very much.